When the action potential reaches the axon terminal, it triggers the release of chemicals known as neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft, which is a fluid-filled gap between neurons that's less than a millionth of an inch wide. Neurotransmitters from this presynaptic neuron are taken up, that is, bind to specific receptor sites on dendrites of nearby neurons, stimulating them and starting their action potential. So, what happens to the neurotransmitters after they've affected the postsynaptic neuron? They can't just stay where they are because they might continue exerting their effects long after the presynaptic neuron has stopped firing. To avoid this problem, some neurotransmitters are deactivated by special cleanup enzymes that break them up into their chemical components. More commonly, though, neurotransmitters are not destroyed, but they're reused. In this process, called synaptic reuptake, the neurotransmitter molecules, after they've had their effect on the postsynaptic cell, are rejected from the receptors, vacuumed up by the molecular pumps back into the presynaptic axon terminals, and repackaged for future use. Through this process, one individual neuron influences thousands of others, and thousands of neurons can influence one, all simultaneously. This is the brain in action. It's critical that all of the major neurotransmitters are present in sufficient amounts all the time. When there are insufficient amounts of neurotransmitters, it upsets the chemical balance of our brain. Importantly, neurotransmitters can be classified by function. Excitatory neurotransmitters. These types of neurotransmitters have excitatory effects on the neuron they increase the likelihood that the neuron will fire an action potential. Some of the major excitatory neurotransmitters include epinephrine and norepinephrine. Inhibitory neurotransmitters. These types of cells have an inhibitory effect on the neuron. They decrease the likelihood that the neuron will fire an action potential. Some of the major inhibitory neurotransmitters include serotonin and GABA. Now, some neurotransmitters, such as acetylcholine and dopamine, can have both excitatory and inhibitory effects, depending on the type of receptors that are present. Glutamate and GABA are the most common neurotransmitters in the central nervous system. Neurons in virtually every brain area use these two chemical messengers to communicate with each other. Glutamate rapidly excites neurons, increasing the odds that they will talk with other neurons. The release of glutamate is associated with enhanced learning and memory. When abnormally elevated, Glutamate may contribute to schizophrenia and other mental disorders because in high doses it can be toxic, damaging neural receptors by overstimulating them. GABA, in contrast, inhibits neurons by dampening neural activity. That's why most anti-anxiety medications bind to GABA receptors. They tend to suppress overactive brain areas linked to worry. GABA is considered an absolute workhorse in our central nervous system, playing critical roles in learning, memory, and sleep. Beyond an excitatory or inhibitory effect, there are also various ways to enhance or impede the actions of a neurotransmitter by introducing chemicals in the form of medications. Chemicals that enhance a transmitter's activity are called agonists. Those that diminish a transmitter's activity are called antagonists. Agonists exert their influence in many ways. Some agonists actually mimic the neurotransmitter, so on their own, they can activate the receptors. Other agonists block the reuptake of the transmitter into the presynaptic cell. And still, others work by counteracting the cleanup enzyme that breaks down the transmitter after it has triggered a response. Both of these mechanisms have the effect of leaving more transmitters within the synaptic gap. 
This increases the transmitter's opportunity to influence the postsynaptic membrane, and so ends up increasing both the strength and the duration of the transmitter's effect. Antagonists work through similar mechanisms, but with the opposite effect. Thus, some antagonists prevent the transmitter from working by binding themselves to the synaptic receptor and blocking off the transmitter, essentially serving as a kind of putty in the synaptic lock. Other antagonists operate by speeding up reuptake, and others by augmenting cleanup enzymes. Cocaine, for example, is an agonist. It works by blocking the reuptake of dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine into the presynaptic molecules. The effect is arousal throughout the body, restlessness, and in some cases, euphoria. Many antidepressant medications, including Prozac, Zoloft, and Paxil, work in roughly the same way, but specifically block the reuptake of serotonin. Still, other drugs are antagonists. Some of the medications used for schizophrenia, for example, block postsynaptic receptors and seem effective in helping patients control psychotic thinking and restore normal functioning in their lives. Opiates, such as codeine and morphine, also function as agonists, increasing receptor site activity. They reduce our emotional response to painful stimuli by binding with opioid receptors and mimicking endorphins. Tranquilizers such as Xanax, whose generic name is Alprazolam, diminish anxiety by stimulating GABA receptor sites, thereby driving down neural activity. Another key idea is that individual neurons are selective in what neurotransmitter they will respond to. Many neurons are responsive to more than one neurotransmitter. But even so, each neuron has its own pattern of sensitivities. For example, a neuron inhibited by GABA will respond differently, or perhaps not at all, to molecules of serotonin that happen to float by. This notion of receptors being selective in their response and the idea of different neurotransmitters providing different signals are key elements in controlling the complex flow of information throughout the brain. Though the neurotransmitter system has provided some evidence specificity at the molecular level, it's important to remember that a mental event Thought, perception, memory, or emotion is not created by only one set of neurons or one type of neurotransmitter. Instead, combinations of different neurons and associated neurotransmitters can create similar instances of these experiences. Neuroscientists call this principle degeneracy. Degeneracy means many to one. Many combinations of neurons can produce the same outcome. In the quest to map the brain, degeneracy is an important, humbling reality check. To be humbled even further, the opposite is also true about the brain. Along with degeneracy, many parts of the brain serve more than one purpose. The brain contains core systems, or networks of neurons that participate in creating a wide variety of mental states. A single core system or network can play a role in thinking, remembering, decision-making, seeing, hearing, and experiencing. A core system is one to many. That is, a single brain area or network contributes to many different mental states and behaviors. So, from this brief description of the structure and function of the brain, it is clear that neuroscientists have made enormous progress, but there are also many, many miles to go.